This is a sermon by the Reverend Ed Bartle, rector of St. Edward's Episcopal Church, at the memorial service for Deacon Barbara Keeter, July 27, 2013, in Mount Dora. I tell you, if you see that what you already are, you know, we get in this habit of saying things. I'm preaching for Barbara. And I don't know whether I'm more nervous preaching in front of the bishop or knowing that Barbara's looking down as I preach. <laughs> you know, if anyone were to ask me to describe Barbara Peter in one thought, I would have to defer to Christ's answer to the scribe's question as to what is the greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But Barbara loved her Lord with all her heart, all her soul, and all her mind. And she was a friend to all who came to her. Now, I don't want to make Barbara blush as she's looking down or make her feel uncomfortable because I know that she would, she would tell me don't do that, but I'm going to do it anyway because I'd kind of like to connect her to somebody else in history that I feel a resemblance. And that's Julian of Norwich, the 14th century anchoress. You see, Julian had a life-threatening illness and was healed. A number of years ago, Barbara attended a Pentecostal service with her sister and was healed. Her legs became the same length. If you know Barbara, there's a story that goes with that. But her life-threatening disease kept Barbara on a perpetual death sentence. I, along with others in the, here, other uh, priests here, <clears throat> had probably given Barbara last rites a half a dozen times. Whenever we felt, or she felt, that death was imminent. And like Mark said, she was looking forward to going home. She stayed in a lot of pain, but was not going to leave until it was her time. And so I would give her last rites, but God always had other plans for her, and she recovered. Julian also chose to be an anchoress and lived in a cell attached to the church of St. Julian for the balance of her life, where she met and prayed for her people. Well, Barbara's cell was her house, just a couple blocks down Grandview here, where she was confined either to her bed or to the chair in her living room, but always, always willing to meet and pray for others. And when she could muster up the energy, she would actually come to church. When she first came up to St. Edwards uh, about three years ago, she was here pretty well every Sunday, and I would ask her, because she had such a direct channel, as Julian did, I think, with God, I would say, Barbara, would you please go over to the Lady Chapel, and if anybody has special prayer needs, go see Barbara, and she would pray over the people, more often than not, with their oxygen tank. But she would pray, and when she couldn't make it, she would pray from her house. Julian was a highly practical and a woman noted for her optimism, her joyful outlook of life. Barbara was practical, joyful, and she had a great sense of humor. But she never, never blamed God for her illness, but often felt that she was finished, she was tired, and she was looking forward to seeing her Savior face to face. On many occasions, I would go over to Barbara's house to take her communion and to spend some time with her, only to have her point her finger at me, as only Barbara could do. <laughs> She'd point her finger at me, and in the most loving manner, she would make suggestions to help me become a better rector. She would smile, offer her thoughts, and tell me that God had placed me here at St. Edward's for a reason. And then as her medications took effect, she would softly and slowly drift off to sleep. I knew it was time to leave. <laughs> there was a time, uh, several years ago, three years ago, four years ago, a bunch of years ago, when I was installed here at St. Edward's, 
And many of you remember my father, who was deacon em uh, emeritus at uh, Holy Spirit. Now my father came up to my installation about six months before he died. And my sister had brought him down to my brother's house in Georgia and with, his, with oxygen tanks. But my sister didn't check. They were all empty. And so Barbara said, well, let me go home and get you a tank. And Barbara brought a tank to my father so that he could breathe. Very nice. My sister, however, she, Barbara even offered to say, just take the tank. When you take him home, take it with you. And my sister said, no, I'll just hook him up. He won't know any different. He'll be fine. <laughs> Actually, Barbara asked for the readings to come from her ordination vows. About two years ago, I met with Barbara for the purpose of making her final arrangements, her final funeral arrangements. And we went through the prayer book as good, good, solid uh, Episcopalians, checked the book, the one with the source, and said, these are the recommended scriptures for a burial. So Barbara picked out the one. She actually picked 2 Corinthians, which I love to preach from, because it talks about the tenth existence. And, and so we picked those, and we picked some music. And about a year ago, after her mother died, she was talking to Susie and, and uh, Calvin and the others, and she met with Susie Blake and asked her to change her ordination scriptures and put together a new format, and asked her to present them to me and to ask me to honor her request. She wanted these vow or these scriptures from her ordination. Barbara was truly the personification of her ordination vows. During the examination, if you look at the prayer book on the uh, ordination of a deacon, there's an examination where the bishop would ask questions, and one of the questions he would ask, he would say, my sister, every Christian is called to follow Christ, serving God the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit. God now calls you to a special ministry of servanthood directly under your bishop. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are to serve all people, particularly the poor, the weak, the sick, and the lonely. The bishop would then ask, My sister, do you believe that you are truly called by God and his church to the life and work of a deacon? Her answer, I believe I am so called. Other questions would call her to be faithful in prayer, in the reading and study of Holy Scriptures, she would be asked, will you look for Christ in all others, being ready to help and serve those in need? Will you in all things seek not your glory, but the glory of the Lord Christ? And I'm sure she lived by the answers that she gave, and I'm sure that the Lord is saying to her right now, well done, good and faithful servant. Barbara chose her first reading from the book of Jeremiah. Before I was called to the priesthood, I spent a number of years as an ordained deacon, and I recall my thoughts as I listened to those same words of Jeremiah at my ordination, and I wonder if Barbara shared my thoughts. I'm sure that anyone taking those vows would have had the same fear. Am I worthy? Why am I called? What makes me think that I'm here for this? But I don't think Barbara would have asked that question herself. Because I think Barbara knew she was called, and she accepted the call, and she went to perform the call as God had directed her to do. The rest of us ask, why has the Lord selected me? We may even ask, but God was speaking to Jeremiah. What's that got to do with me? Well, Paul spoke to this in his letter to the Romans in the 8th chapter where he wrote, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Jeremiah has never been accused of following the path of a prophet for personal gain or taking on the role out of self-importance, for he was hesitant in even answering the call, just as Moses was when he was called. But God's answer to Jeremiah has something to do with all of us. 
What Jeremiah had said about himself might be true, that he was young and, and, and inexperienced. That may have been true. When he said, what is it, but the proper question that he should have asked, and the question that we should all ask, is not, whom am I to do this? Why am I called? But our answer should be, what are my instructions? What is it that I am to do? And will God be with me? You see, Barbara had answers to those questions and gave herself to those in need, caring for her family as they died off of her one by one, offering comfort to others as she faced her own grief. And I don't recall Barbara ever complaining of her situation, but always talking about the concerns she had with brothers. And how appropriate the psalm that she chose, the 84th psalm. The, in some uh, Bibles it's titled, The Blessed, Blessedness of Dwelling in the House of God. And in the 10th verse it reads, For a day in your court is better than a thousand days in my home. I would rather be a gatekeeper, I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wickedness. You see, a deacon's symbol is just that. It's the doorway. With a deacon standing in the doorway with one foot into the community and one foot into the church. One foot into the community to bring the concerns of the people to God's altar. And one foot in the church to bring the word of God to the people. Barbara can stand with one foot in heaven now and one foot in the world. Carry our concerns to the Father, dear Barbara. There is a saying attributed to Julian of Norwich, which he claimed was said to her by God himself. All shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Dear Barbara, all shall be well. All shall be well, and a manner of all things shall be well. Let's pray. O God, who has made thy servant Barbara to flourish among the ministers of thy word in the honorable office of a deacon, grant me beseech thee that she may also be joined with them who have gone before in a perpetual fellowship. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord.